It's game over for Retro and for Chris. All this and more coming up on This Week in Retro. High resolution color graphics. This land of high technology. The revolution in technology that made the information age possible. Those kids are not afraid of computers. A truly bizarre Amiga list. He's not even Australian. <laughs> Come on. No edits this week, Chris. Come on. <laughs> And I've been sacked by game. All this and more coming up on this week's show. Up to date news for out of date tech. Good morning. Morning. Good morning. It is a sad day for this week in retro. It's the very last show um, with Chris as a host because there is an open invite for him to come back as a guest. So we'll see you next week, Chris. But um, he is, oh. is his last show <laughs> as, a, as a host. So it's the last time I can ask uh, us all, including Chris, what we've been up to this week. And let's start with Chris. What have oh, you been yeah. up to with your last ever week, Chris? What have I been up to? <laughs> oh, what have I been up to? I been away. You've got all your fears in order, written your will. Yes, it's all, it's all, it's all in order. Um, everybody knows what to do. They've got my my last wishes. Um, no, no. Well, I was away at the weekend, so not much retro gaming stuff has been going on, in all honesty, because um, I was just away at a beach, and I don't even usually go in the ocean because everything over here wants to kill you, but there wasn't even any killy things in the, in the water. So I actually No seaside went, arcades? I went in. Oh, okay. No. There was no most boring beach ever, right? There was no seaside arcades. There was nowhere to buy a stick of rock to break your teeth on. There was, and and, and the beach, the most boring beach you've ever seen, right? There's just white sand and turquoise water, and pretty much oh, nobody to terrible. talk to. Pretty much nobody the there. Oh. No, no, nothing. Did nothing. you did you have, did you have your thongs on? I did indeed. I don't. I had to buy some while I was there, only because. I usually just use my shoes, but the shoes I've got now I quite like. And I'm like, no, I can't wreck these on the beach. So, um, yeah, so had to buy some thongs, which, depending on where you're from, are not what you're thinking. <laughs> Flip-flops. Yes. Flip-flops. What, um, but, yeah, other than that, I sliders. recently got – I recently got a – oh, yeah, sliders is another name, isn't it? Where's that? Is that America? Slippers. Oh, are they? Uh, I'm not sure. This Week okay. in Footwear. Anyway, <laughs> I recently picked up a perfect score. Well, they described it as an, a pretty much perfect score when I played this arcade game. I don't know if you've ever played it before. You, it's almost like VR. You have to look through these like goggle things, and then you, they give you a, a button to press, and then you have to like press the button at the right times when you see certain things in VR. I think it was called, what was it called? Um, peripheral it vision called eye, eye, eye exam. Because that's what it sounds like. Yeah, it's called peripheral <laughs> vision eye exam. <laughs> so there you go. Almost per- oh, yeah. I don't know if you guys have ever done, have you done one? And did, did it this- feel like playing an arcade game when you did it? Did it happen at the side of a road when an officer asked you to step out your car? Oh, is that no. what you actually mean? <laughs> yeah, it was really actually. Yeah, yeah. It was a oh, real oh, oh, star. Exactly. You've done that, yeah, and, and you get the red dot. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I couldn't help it. I'm like sitting there with it. I'm going to ace this. I'm absolutely <laughs> going to shoot every one of these red dots down. Right? And that's exactly how I played it. Oh, oh, that's pretty much a perfect score. Yeah, that's very good. Well done. <laughs> yeah. High score. Where's the high score list? Put it up. Put my name up on the wall. Anyway, other than that, also, uh, um, last pickup you'll ever see from me, unless I have pickups when I come on as a I've guest. Got, I know what you picked up, and I've got it here as well. Oh, uh, what have you got? So I'm just going to describe this as what Please. I picked up, which was local um, in Perth, is the only Jaguar game worth owning. Dave? <laughs> Actually, Dave's Dave right. Up Dave's Jaguar right. I'm gonna, have to throw, I'm gonna have to throw this one in the bin because Dave's actually got it right. Okay, um, the one that's almost worth Iron Soldier, which I've been after for a while, and it wasn't expensive. So there you go. The only Jaguar game, other than AVP, I guess. Did Iron Soldier ever? Um, did really Iron not. Soldier ever come with like a great big joystick twin stick setup, or was it just with the pad? I guess the pad had enough buttons on it just, as it was. You want extra peripherals for the Jag, Neil. <laughs> uh, it could work yeah. quite well, actually. If you had like a twin stick with a with a slot in the middle, you could slide the pad in and have all of those numbers, uh, yeah, those true. buttons on the joypad in the middle. Basically a keyboard. Yeah. Anyway, and the last one, and then I'll, and then I'll idea, shut up now. Oh, go on. A good idea, 30 years too late. Go on, Chris. Yes, yes. I'm sure there's a market for it, Neil. I mean, after all, there's clearly a market for Jags and Jaguar games, right? Because they're ridiculously expensive. So I think you should put everything you've got into marketing that joystick. <laughs> that's definitely that's cheap. 
that's cheap, Chris, because <laughs> I've been looking at Neo Geo games recently, and Ooh, ooh that's true. Is a whole nother level for yeah. for in in many cases bad games or the next iteration of the same game king of fighters 94 95 96 uh, 97 yeah, yeah. it's worse All than Street fifa fighter 2 it's worse than fifa but you don't find them in charity shops mm. anyway yeah true did they you wouldn't visit? know what it was um no where i'm going to visit so this week i will be going to i've not been there it's a place called uh planet royale uh barcade so i think it's actually it goes by planet royale and barcadia i believe in northbridge in perth and I'm meeting a couple of the admins from the Perth Amiga users group to do yeah. some gaming and some eating, and they'll do some drinking, I'm driving, um, and some planning for, for what we're going to do in the Perth Amiga user group for the rest of the year. So that'll be good fun. Yep. Good. What, what Chris is going to do with all that free time he's going to have now he's not <laughs> yeah. hosting the podcast. Well, I've had a pretty good week. I've been working on the Sega Megatech. I've got episode two under my belt, which patrons are watching, and that will be public by the time this goes out. So you can see the progress we've made on that big, dirty Sega arcade that I've been restoring. It's going well so mm. far. Mm. Uh, I didn't know whether I should bring this up or not because it's going to break Dave's little heart. Um, I sold a thing and I bought a thing. Um, I sold a thing which is really not even worth mentioning. It raised a, a bit of money. There was a thing on eBay that uh, really? I had my eye on. It was far too much money, but I put in a silly offer, uh, and they met me halfway at a very good price. Dave, I now have to accompany my Ultima 7, the Silver Seed expansion pack. Do you? Did you buy that? I bought it. At less than <laughs> half the price he was asking. How much was he asking? He was asking four hundred pounds. Jeez, jeez, Played. that's an expensive game. Ooh. It really is an expensive game. It is. The, the, for Ultima Seven and Ultima Seven Part Two, there was one expansion for them. There was Forge of Virtue and there was Silver Seed, and they are super, super expensive. Serpent I don't know Isle, why they're so expensive. Serpent Isle. No, Serpent. You bought the one for Serpent Isle, yeah? And no, it's no, I got good. Silver Seed. Silver Seed is part two, Serpent Isle, isn't it? And then it's the first one, Forge of Virtue, Serpent Isle. Yes. Yeah, that's the right. first one's called Ultima Seven, and then you've got Ultima Seven, the Silver Seed, and then you've got Ultima yeah. Seven Part Two, which is Serpent Isle, and you've Serpent got Isle. the Silver Seeds. As, and as the, the Serpent as Isle is even even more expensive and hard to get hold yeah. of. But yeah, I did just to be clear, I didn't pay four hundred. I paid la- less than half of that, and that was covered by some bits that I sold. So um, yeah, I know it's an expensive thing, yeah, but uh, I'm going to have to get a cabinet to put that in. I can't have that sat on a shelf for people to pick up and who knows laser what? alarms and all the rest of it. Exactly, exactly. But I'll let you touch it, yeah. Dave, when you come and visit. And. <laughs> no, it's in end. with gloves on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I do have. I do some lovely ultimas behind me. I'm, I'm happy for you. I'm happy for you. Thank you. Yeah, you love an yeah. ultima here. Okay. Um, Dave, what have you been up to this week? I've been on a journey, an amazing journey, on YouTube. I, I see. About six or seven years ago, I fell out with modern AAA gaming. And I dipped back in in the end of 2019 with a game that everyone said was great called The Outer Worlds. And I really saw through that. I saw behind the curtain. And I, I, that, that was the last modern game I've played other than Baldur's Gate 3. I played RPGs and computers since the 80s. And then with Bioware and Bethesda taking over and things creeping away from the story and tactical routes to a kind of a more console a more casual experience with towards games like far cry assassin creed and so on that kind of gameplay coming in and around the time after they did dragon age and mass effect one bioware really went down this consoleization of games now i'm not saying it's bad because it's not loads of people enjoyed them they opened the games up for more people enjoy but it wasn't what i was looking for and i kind of fell away but it never really worked out what was wrong with it I couldn't quite put a finger on it until I watched some amazing, really long videos from a channel called Never Knows Best that covered RPGs. He, he kind of talks about things. He knows about things from back in retro until now, and it's all become crystal clear. I've watched eight and a half hours of documentary-style content from him <laughs> in the past week, and it's it's just it's just revealed what I what I thought and I couldn't quite grasp. But the good news is. 
He's shown me as modern gaming has moved away from RPG's roots towards this kind of action console style game. It's left a gap and there's been some kickstarted games that I've not paid any attention to that have kind of filled in the gaps and come back with traditional RPGs uh, that now get called CRPGs. Apparently that's the right word for them, even though CRPG for me just means anything. But no, it means that. So um, really amazing stuff to find out in my own head, just kind of reveal what I thought, but I couldn't quite put my finger on. Uh, A link in the show notes to the channel, but yeah, amazing. Fantastic. I was reading an article the other day about um, it was the top 100 PC games. It was quite um, a depressing read. It was sort of modern PC games. And um, I was kind of struck by how casual a lot of the games were um, or how a lot of the games just didn't appeal to me. You know, there might be absolutely fantastic games with a huge amount of effort put into them, but they just weren't ticking my boxes. And then, it's, yeah, yeah. I, I don't want to knock them down. I mean, casual well, no, I'm, could I'm, also be saying accessible. Yeah, yeah but it's yeah. just not what I want. But there was one at number one. Uh, uh, the name completely escapes me now, so I'm going to try and find it before the end of the show. It was a game I'd never heard of before. It was uh, an RPG, but not in the traditional sense. Um, and I thought, well, they're saying it's number one. I've got to play it. So before the end of the show, I'll try and figure out what that game was. And Disco share Elysium? Yes. <laughs> That's it. That's no, I, 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 that was a guess. That was a guess. Yes. Yeah, that was and number it was one. And it was one of the traditional CRPGs that have come in behind all these AAA games and said, look, uh, he, he back to our roots. Yeah, I've not played it. I've been told I should Hang play on. it. But yeah. What did you say it was called? Disco Elysium. Yes, that is definitely the one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and apparently it's sort of not like other RPGs, but it's yes. got that kind of three-quarter view, um, yes. isometric view, but it is 3D. Worth playing then? I've not played it. Um, the, according to... We all need to play According this. Never Knows Best, yes, it is worth playing it. There was a video he did on modern RPGs, modern proper RPGs. No, I, I feel as if I'm, I'm knocking these... Just because I don't like them doesn't mean they're not good. I mean, loads of people love these games. But yeah, uh, he, on modern art CRPGs, and he, that was one of the three that he picked out. There you go. Disco Elysium, also available on the Switch, so I might try it on that just so I can pick up and play it whenever I want. Anyway... Um, it's it sounds like we've all had a good week with every section that we go through on this show i'm just thinking oh that's the last time chris is doing that bit oh. that's sad <laughs> let's <laughs> so let's sadly move on to our first story the first story then is uh, i hope right up chris's street i chose it for him um i wasn't going to choose it because we had a sega game list last week and this is another list based story but i thought i'd pick out some amiga content for chris So here we go. It's quite a bizarre list, and I think our listeners will have plenty to talk about it uh, on it. And also, I think there's one thing on it that's that's going to anger Dave tremendously. So we'll get to that point. The list is shared by listener Lord Borak three one six on our subreddit reddit.com forward slash r forward slash this week in retro. It's an article by David Heath over on gamerant.com, and the link will be in the show notes. And it's the best. 14 i don't know how he's he's come to 14 but the best 14 amiga games in his opinion so let's get it's started because there are only 14 list. amiga games is that right uh, and and uh, as i did last week chip in at any point guys if you want to comment on the games as i work through them so from the from the back at, at number 14 is a game many people will never have heard of it's called guardian released in 1994 this is a 3d game in the style of star wing or star fox depending on your region Um, Or to put it another way, it completely rips off the look of Star Wing. Uh, It really does. The mechanics are totally different, though. This is more like a 3D version of Defender than is um, the the, the story-driven narrative of the Super Nintendo's game. Very different. So have either of you have played this? It was on the 1200 and the CD32 in 94, so AGA only. Chris is nodding. Worth mm-hmm. a go, Chris? I've, I've played it briefly on the A2500 as part of my quest of, you know, what does the A1200 do that I don't think the A500 could have done? Um, and I guess this is up there. I've, I've, re- I've been recently thinking about this as something that's so much better than um, Cybermorph on the Jaguar. <laughs> kind of similar True. concept, but infinitely better, infinitely better than Cybermorph on the Jaguar. I haven't actually played it. It's from uh, an era of the Amiga when I'd already departed, moved to PC. Um, so maybe I'll check it out. But watching it on YouTube doesn't make me want to do it. It looks a bit bit tech demo-ish when there are games like Star Glider out there and Elite, of course, which is, you know, looks like a much more in-depth game. 
Anyway, let's get through this list. Number 13, absolute no-brainer, Turrican 2 from 1991, the heyday of the Amiga, and a game that just works so well. Uh, I know it's on other platforms, but I think on the Amiga it has a charm about it that is lacking on the other platforms. Um, I reserve judgment on the more recent AGA remake of it. I haven't tried that one yet to say if that retains the charm. It's a port of the PC version. Um, Uh So the PC version came out a couple of years after. Uh, the the Amiga version. I don't know why they waited so long. It's a really good port of it. Mm. But the Amiga, I, I don't think the Amiga version was lacking anything. I don't think the Amiga version needed anything more. It's no. just perfect as it is. There's just a feel to it. That's, I don't know yeah. if that's my nostalgia or yeah. if it's the game, but it just feels the music right as well. The though. original form. Yeah. Mm. Oh, definitely yeah. the music. Uh, number 12, Syndicate. Now, I met a lad on holiday when I was a teenager. Turned out he had an Amiga, so we chatted all about that. Lived at the other end of the country. When I got home, he posted me a copy of Syndicate and said I had to play it. And to be fair, I did enjoy it, and I think it does deserve a place on a top 30 list for sure. But I always felt that it struggled on my A500. Definitely a more enjoyable game on a more powerful Amiga or a PC for sure. Um did you guys get into that one? I think it's come up on Loved the show it. plenty of times. Love so, yeah. Syndicate. Uh, the, the, the thing about Syndicate, I think that got me, uh, okay, it's a strategy game with a little bit of, of kind of um, fairly easy action to it. A lot, of the, a lot of the action depends on how good you are at the strategy, but I just like being bad. It's just it's just refreshing to be the bad guy, just to not, not to go out and deliberately do harm, but just to say, we don't care about anything else other than winning. And you get out and you're, you, you, you're uh, sort of a, a, a organized crime um, taking over the world kind of thing. It's just uh, it, it's nice to not be the good guy for a change. Mowing uh, people down with the minigun, yes, which Chris. was a, a thing with Peter Molyneux games. I wonder why why that was that he always didn't <laughs> want to be the good guy. <laughs> hmm, true, did have a good minigun. Um, no, I played it on the PC, so I don't, I never played it on the Amiga. So for me, it's a PC yeah. game, and I was never that good at it. I would just sort of stack my guys up rather than doing oh, all the strategy like you're saying, Dave. I would just kind of use one guy at a time, so I was treating them more like lives, <laughs> if you know what I mean. So, oh, yeah, <laughs> wasn't that good at it. But it was a good game. Um, number eleven, Theme Park, another great game, nineteen ninety four, so a later game again. And like Syndicate, this also benefited from the grunt of a PC, but it's it's a classic, and yes, it belongs on the list. But I think personally, I would choose an earlier title to represent those empire building kind of games. So, SimCity, Railroad Tycoon, Civilization—they all run brilliantly on an Amiga. They're just as addictive, if not more. Um, June two, what about June two? You know, that might be the number one choice on the Amiga for for that kind of game. But theme parks there. Number 10, one of Chris's favorites, Lotus Turbo Challenge 2, which I covered recently with the Amigos on their visit to the cave. Perhaps the closest thing to OutRun that we got on the platform. Uh, although Dave might argue Jag XJ220. Yeah, this is this is this is this is a good game. I I, I slightly prefer it, but probably because I, I probably prefer it because I've got a Jaguar. Um, <laughs> but also, I tend to like the underdog, so that that that's by the same team, I think. Um, and it's it's the underdog game compared to to Lotus, but it's a good game. There's a game in a, a similar outrun style on the Amiga called Moonshine Racers. It's all about driving <laughs> a rickety old truck as fast as you can with the moonshine on. It's not a great game, but if, if someone wants to try something different, that's well worth a go. Um, I think it scored sort of in the 80% region. So, yeah, not a smash hit, but fun. Anyway, 9 and 10 sports titles in Speedball 2 and Sensible World of Soccer. That's the version of Sensi that came out in 94. There were earlier versions. And by that point, it was fighting hard against FIFA, which was now available. And to be honest, FIFA, sluggish and dull in comparison to Sensi Kickoff 2 or Goal. Playability over presentation was clinging on, but FIFA would, of course, steamroller anything in its path in time. Um, I always felt that was a bit of a sad time when FIFA came out because, to me, it was just obviously a worse game. It was just obviously slower, but it Marketing just stunned everyone. content, yeah. Yeah, with its presentation. It was almost a step back to the 8-bit style football games and that kind of different point of view, whereas the top-down was really killing it for playability. But there we go, FIFA won out. From the same team as Sensible Soccer at number seven, it's Cannon Fodder. Not too many controversies so far, I know, on this list. It's another classic. Uh, It does get a bit odd beyond this point, but um, Cannon Fodder Syndicate 
kind of similar in their style, you know, point and click, point now moving a little team of people around killing people. Uh, Cannon Fodder was 24th of March, 1993, that came out. Uh, Syndicate, 6th of June, 1993. Um, so only three months in it. I, I, it's impossible. Um, well, it would be wrong to say that Syndicate was influenced by Cannon Fodder because they would have been in development at exactly the same time. But very interesting that such... They are very different, but kind of a, a similar um, mm. new new genre being created at that time, new style. Yeah. Um, number six, perhaps the weakest genre for the platform. Well, have a guess. What do you think is the weakest genre for the Amiga? Games. Oh! Oh! That's it. I'm leaving. That. I'm I, leaving. I don't the mean podcast. it. I don't mean it. I don't mean it at all. <laughs> I know it's coming, though. I, I, can't, I can't lie and say... A, I, I don't know what's coming. Um, yeah, it's true. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the Amiga. It's all about productivity, Dave. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the weakest genre, most would argue, is beat-em-ups. Shadow Fighter is yeah. one of them. It's described in the list as a diamond in the rough. Very good-looking game. 1994. Uh, perhaps the best attempt at a Street Fighter 2 we've seen on the Amiga, but I'll be honest, I still reach for IK Plus if I'm going for an Amiga fighter. Um I thought I'd look up the manual for this game because it's 1994. It's on the CD32. The CD32 has a six-button pad. Guess what? One button. What? One button is used. <laughs> it's oh, a combo of, of twirling the stick and pressing the one button to get your move, which is – that's exactly how, how IK Plus works. You do a direction and a button. But that's an 8-bit game from far earlier. Yeah. Street Fighter II didn't hadn't come out by that point to set the standard. Come on, guys. 1994 – five unused buttons the the the, 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 the big problem with these games was they were trying to do what street fighter 2 did without the buttons so they're mm. going to do it in the cd32 you've got the buttons and you don't use them as criminal yeah yeah <sighs> number five it's a point and click adventure game and there are plenty of those to choose from i won't ask you which to guess because i know you've read the article but i was surprised were you surprised to see this as the answer you guys? No, I, 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 I think it belongs there. Um, okay. I, it feels like an, if an Amiga, the Amiga is a British computer, even though it's not. So this is a British game. Yeah, and um, that game is yeah. Simon the Sorcerer. Um, yeah, a good one available on floppy. I think it was available as a talkie on the PC on CD-ROM. Was and, it on on the CD-ROM? and the CD thirty two. The CD thirty two. It was, wasn't it? Yeah. Which is the only um, point and click adventure I've played. <laughs> so there you go. Did it? Okay, Chris, you've played it on the CD thirty two. Did it have that problem that Beneath a Steel Sky had, where if you had the voice acting enabled, you had to wait three or four seconds each time for the CD to seek the voice clip and play it? it was, I didn't it, notice any delay that was causing me frustration. Let me put it that way. Good, that so, must be better then. And Beneath yeah. the Steel Sky, you just I just ended up turning the voice clips off to make it a smoother game. Oh, okay. um, fine on the PC. It was just a, an Amiga problem. But um, yeah, Simon Sorcerer, a good, a good game, but there's not a single LucasArts adventure on the list, not a single Sierra game on the list, no Beneath the Steel Sky. And the bigger mission, Monkey Island. You're picking Simon the Sorcerer over Monkey Island, which doesn't appear on the list. <laughs> I, I I would pick Simon the Sorcerer over Monkey Island for an Amiga list because Simon the Sorcerer feels like an Amiga game. Monkey Island was ported to the Amiga from the PC, although the graphics, I think, were done in the Amiga originally. Mm -hmm. True, but a, very few of the games on this list are Amiga exclusives. Uh, so, yeah. Number four. Brace yourselves. Number four. It came from the desert. Fourth best game on the Amiga? It was striking in its presentation, but was it really a top five game? Turrican 2, Speedball 2, is it better mm -hmm. than those two? No. Mm. Good game. Yeah. Interesting. Three. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe they wanted to get the whole Cinemaware thing in, because Cinemaware awesome. were such a, an important thing on the Amiga. Maybe they felt leaving them out was wrong, and they picked what their favourite was. Well, maybe Defender of the Crown, if you want an early example. Yeah. Maybe Wings. Yeah. 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 Um, plenty of choices. Um, okay, number three, third best game of all time on the Amiga. Four words for you. Shadow of the Beast. Yeah. So, Shadow <laughs> of the Beast has a phenomenal atmosphere. The atmosphere in Shadow of the Beast is tremendous. It feels like the kind of exploration kind of 
role playing game elements, that kind of fantasy thing taken seriously. That's good. The music on it is phenomenal. The presentation when the game comes up and all the all the rest of it, absolutely amazing. The hitbox is terrible. The gameplay is basic, <laughs> and the overall game is not enjoyable. And they spent so much effort on making the atmosphere for Shadow of the Beast tremendous, but better than anything had ever come before. The it's one of the first proper Amiga games that came out because you used to get games for Amiga that also came out on the ST and the ST kind of held it back. You couldn't do Shadow of the Beast on the Amiga on the ST the way it was on the Amiga. So you couldn't get Shadow of the Beast on the ST to look as good as Amiga and they didn't. Furious and they this game. And I think you'll find uh, 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 <laughs> but they spent all this all this massive amounts of time and effort on it and they didn't spend the extra few days in the gameplay to say, no, make the hitboxes bigger. No, do this. or ju- Just make the game more enjoyable. Um, there, is a, the ga- there is a far better version of Shadow of the Beast, in my opinion, which is the PC Engine CD version. Completely different game. Uh, well worth playing. I think that works really well. Um, and this week, I've also been playing a lot of Shadow of the Beast on the FM Towns because I've got the car Marty out and some discs. Um, horrible, horrible loading times on the CD-ROM. Um, just as bad as the Amiga in terms of gameplay, but it looks it looks prettier again. It looks very pretty. Wow. There you go. Uh, you, anyway, you, you, are you done, Dave? Are you done it. with Shadow of the Beast? <laughs> I, it maybe does belong there because it, it, it this this is what the Amiga this is what the Amiga was was kind of about. It was like you don't get this in any other system at that time. Well, mm. I still fire it up just to uh, have it on in the background and just to mm. see it scrolling around. But then I do the same with Mega Demos. So if you're going to do that, put you know put space mm. balls on there. Put put Mega Demos on there. Anyway, I still, let's I still move love on. It. No, no, I've got to, I've got to defend Shadow of the Beast because it's one of my okay. all-time favourites. And I, uh, it's only recently when, you know, I've started to hear people go, oh, it was nothing but a tech demo and the gameplay was crap and the hitbox was rubbish. It's a freaking hard game. I've said it before. And I remember, you know, back in the day, it was what made people want to buy an Amiga. Obviously, that's part of the visual and, and the sound and everything. But never once, playing with my mate Steve, he was the first one among us to buy it, never once... Did we sit there going, oh, it looks nice, but the gameplay is a bit rubbish, isn't it? We loved it. We absolutely loved it in the context of the time. So maybe maybe people that just pirated it and didn't, you know, hand over their pocket money for a really nice big box with a T-shirt inside and just pirated games, played them for five minutes and then threw them in the bin. Maybe punching, they're the people ball, that hate punch, it. punching bouncing <laughs> balls. That's what the game is about. Yeah, it's like a to be fever fair, dream. No, no. It's fantastic. Let me, let me, I love it. <laughs> let me speak. Um, I think Chris makes a really good point there. I had a copied version. I hadn't even invested in in the actual version. And um, I didn't ever sit down and say, this is a tech demo back in the day. You're right. I, I, what I said was, this is too bloody hard. Yeah. Um, and I kept yeah. trying and I kept trying and I didn't get very far in it. But, you know, it felt like a game. It is a game. So let's not yeah. go too hard on the tech demo. Number, mm. Number three. Number two, Worms, 1995, the death throes of the Amiga ownership for many. Um, I only played it on the PC. Didn't you know? I'd well moved on by then. Loved it. Um, though. And num- number one, yeah, loved it. Good game. Not an Amiga exclusive. Um, first on the Amiga though. It was an Amiga game first and foremost. And then number one, very strong finish. It's Lemmings, which I mm. think is you know, yeah. It, it there's a strong argument for that on any top list of amiga games uh, and so. it's an amiga exclusive it's never been ported <laughs> what? except for to every single system ever made yeah. even the Aegon console 8 <laughs> as a version oh, and the dear. zx spectrum next so um yeah that's the list um i'm sure a lot you know our listeners have got lots of strong thoughts on that but what are your thoughts let's go to dave my thing with amiga lists that really jumps out at me particularly if you look at, for example, Lemon Amiga, is the amount of games that I think are PC games at the top of the list. About half of the top 20 on there are PC games. And for some of them, um, they're poorer ports of the PC version or it's a poorer experience in the PC version. Now, I'm not saying it's anyone's fault because these are what the games that people remember from their Amigas that they love, and that's fair enough. But it, it doesn't. they don't really typify the Amiga. They don't they don't say this is what the Amiga is all about. Um so I think lists should be Amiga games and there's quite a few I would like on this. 
the, the top one that really belongs here is Frontier. So Elite 2 was a, an Amiga game. You're muted, Neil. It was made on the Amiga. Of course. And it belongs on the... It means it belongs on there. It really should be there. Um, Hybris, mm. Banshee, two two shooters. The, the the owl shooter, the 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 wasp shooter as well. There's no shooters on this, and the Amiga had some really good shooters. Um, Killing Game Show is maybe one of my favourite games just because of the whole atmosphere. It's very slick and enjoyable. It's better on the Amiga and the ST. Although it's great on the ST as well. Um, there's a few games missing here. It's not a terrible list, but. That it's, it's almost as if the person that made it didn't play certain genres of games. I think it's a good list. It's, it's not a terrible list, but unlike last week when I said, well, I can't really think of any other Sega games, I can think of plenty of Amiga games. Um, let's face it, the top three should just simply be Lotus 2, Lotus 1, and Lotus 3. Um, so that sorts <laughs> that out. Um, other than that... There's no flight sims, and maybe that's more niche than I thought it was because I love it like yourself. You know, I absolutely love them back in the – and it's something the Amiga no, not did niche. really well, and there's not a single yeah. flight sim on there. Um, so either Falcon or maybe F-15 Strike Eagle possibly rated the best maybe, or, of course, F-18 Interceptor, which is yeah. the most recognisable because so many people had it in the Batman pack, Neil. Bong. Yeah, um, uh, or if you want to be a bit more arcadey, some of the LucasArts ones um, – uh, what was it? Battle Hawks 1942 was it? Was that the Lucas oh. one? Which was sort of the sprite based one. Worked really well. And that was an earlier game as well, which would represent mm. some of the earlier games in the list because there are, as Dave said, um, some of the later games that were really better on the PC by that point. Anyway, sorry, carry on with your, your thoughts, Chris. Yeah, well, the only other flight, I mean, I, and I played plenty. I've got plenty on my shelf behind me. Um, F-16 Combat Pilot was my favourite, but it's certainly not the best. Um, it's just my favourite for other reasons. But Knights of the Sky, even though it's not Jets, it's a fantastic game. And the physics um, uh, that going on in that game are a technical marvel for the time, really. Um, st- uh, moving away from Flight Sims, Stunt Car Racer. Come on. Um, F1 Grand Prix. Shooters, like Dave mentioned, Swiv is the one that sprang to my mind. Fantastic game, really full on, good gameplay, two player. Batman, I always raise it. I think it's a fantastic game again, Neil. Oh, so just thinking about Swiv, you'll like this, Chris. Um, chap by the name of James Sharman came to visit the cave this weekend. Ooh. Turns out he's uh, the chief technical officer at a video games company, has worked for many uh, companies, worked on games such as, um, well, Swiv 3D. That's why I thought of it. He was he did a lot of the technical bits, made the engine for Swiv uh-huh. 3D. Um, so he came in and just, you know, just booked a ticket, turned up unannounced, got chatting mm. to him. And then next thing you know, he's showing us games that he's made, like Silent Hill Origins that he's worked on. Nice. Yeah, I did that bit. I worked on the fog on this scene. I did this, you know, <laughs> really cool. So, yeah. Anyway, Swift reminded That's me awesome. of that. Carry on. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, no, Swift, fantastic game. I absolutely love it. Batman, I always think it's a, it's a great game. And in fact, it's, you know, four games in one. Um, which and- one? But which one? Well, oh, Batman the movie. the movie. Yeah, Batman the movie I'm referring to. Um, and Alien Breed, fantastic top-down shooter. Mm. You know, reskinned yeah. gauntlet, sure, but it's a fantastic game. So, yeah, there's many more I could rattle off, but, yeah, Pinball Fantasies. Not all of those can go in the top 14. There's only 14 spots there, so we can't get them all in. So I, while I've rattled off loads as well, maybe it's a little bit overcritical of this list because it's unfair to say they've, they've where are these 45 games out your top 14 <laughs> <laughs> well yeah i i don't think the list really explores the, the diverseness uh, of, you know the diverse list of excellent games that are available on the platform uh, by diverse i mean all the different genres all of hmm. the, the the games that started genres the games that specifically worked really well on the amiga um, I put a huge number of hours into games on the Amiga, including North and South, Formula mm. One that Chris mentioned, Flashback in Another World, mm. Wings, mm-hmm. Supercars, New Zealand Story, mm. June 2 mentioned Chaos Engine, Kickoff 2. Um, and I think my number one would change according to my, my, my mood. But today I'm just going to go with F1 GP because it's very much based on nostalgic memories. Um, I think it was my first experience of a properly properly true 3d racing game um not not sprite based or scalar based uh playing it with friends hot seating it with friends all of that stuff so um that would be my choice today but as it's all about chris today and he gets the last say chris <laughs> you can tell us what is 
the definitive number one Amiga game of all time, now and forever? Take it away. I actually hate this question (laughs) because it depends on your mood. It really does depend on your mood. Mm, So when I'm asked this question, I always ended up end up just leaning back on my own nostalgia and I say Batman um, because for me, when I play that game, when I fire it up and I hear the music and I hear the sound effects, it's it's day one of my Amiga ownership in a box. I I just love that experience, but that's very particular to me. Um, So given that's a personal answer, if I was to pick one game out of all the Amiga games I've played. It has to be Maria Whitaker's Christmas box. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if we're going if we're going by that as the standard, um, when I got my Amiga, it had a game called Power Play. It had a game called No Excuses, and it had a game called Eliminator. All very much sort of eight bit era games that came over to yeah. me because I was a little bit earlier than the Batman pack, but I've you know, for the very same reason as you, Chris, they're not games that anyone really remembers or remembers fondly, but I do because they're the only games I had to play that Christmas. Um, so I just played them over and over. In fact, it wasn't even Christmas. I think it was October sort of time that I got it. But yeah. 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 Nice. Uh, and I guess, Dave, you were before the Power Pack with your Atari ownership? So I got I got the Power Pack. So I got the you very first Power, power Pack. Packs. Yeah. Uh, Everything I can find online say it came out and said it came out in January or February 1989, but I seem to get it at Christmas 1988. As if I yeah. don't know, maybe they ran out of normal stock and they had it. I don't know, but yeah, Power Pack, amazing. Um, and then before yeah. that, the Amsoft pack for both of us. <laughs> well, Amsoft. no, I didn't get the Amsoft pack. No, because I got the six one two eight. I didn't get any packings other oh, you're than a posh boy. Yeah, uh, so I, I got a four pack. Of, I think I got Manic Miner and Jet Four pack. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's that's the Scottish way of buying an Amstrad, is it? Yeah. Yeah. Four pack of tenants and an Amstrad six one two eight. Big bag of cans. <laughs> Our show is very kindly sponsored today by PCBWay.com. PCBWay are not just the manufacturers of PCBs by your own design, but also they do 3D printing, CNC milling, and they have a wonderful shared project space where you can go and explore projects, including lots and lots of retro projects. These are things that people have designed, such as disk drive interfaces, SD card interfaces, accelerators, um, or even just things like 3D printed stands in which to put your 6128 discs, Dave, on your desk and keep them neat. They're all there in the shared project section. And at the click of a button, you can put it in your basket and uh, it can be winging its way over to you. So PCB Way are just as retro as we are in some parts of their website. I saw something on Twitter this morning and it was X. someone that had got, th- sorry, Twitter <laughs> this morning, and it was someone that had got PCB Way to 3D print in metal. And it was okay. a little hammer. Yeah. Must be some kind of special filament. Yeah. So uh, I, they do all sorts of stuff, but yeah, just uh, it's just amazing the, the stuff they do as well as the PCBs. And, of course, we open sourced, or Heba open sourced, the Mr. Multi system, which is right there in their projects. You can you can order a fully made-up board from PCBWay, get yourself a multi system, and get them to 3D print the case as well or go to uh, you know Heber's shop to get a case to go with it. But it's all there at pcbway.com. And we thank them very much for supporting the show. Thank you. Chris, as this is your last show and you haven't said anything in our sponsorship slot, please say some words. Thank you, PCBWay. We are an audience-led show. You pick the stories, you suggest them on the subreddit, and we look at what's popular and choose what we think is an interesting topic. This week, though, the top story is more than twice as upvoted as the next one down, so I felt compelled to cover it. As, of course, the sad story of Chris leaving. This is Chris on his last show, and this very kind message was put in our subreddit by SpringyNZ1. Sad news from the podcast with Chris saying he is leaving the show, but fully understand his reasons. As soon as your hobby starts to feel like your job, it's time to stop and do something about it and get back to what you love doing. I always felt that Chris was the host I resonated with the most. I love the hobby, but I'm time poor. I don't have time to play all the games I want, so I do want to focus on what means the most to me. 
I am never going to pick up a soldering iron or spend weeks refur refurbishing a system, and I feel that Chrissy's view to the extent represented mine. Although he does need to drop flight sims for RPGs, yes, and develop an obsession with sensible soccer, boo. <laughs> Above <laughs> all, on one show, Chris said something that I could relate to. Like him, I emigrated from the UK to another country, in my case, New Zealand. And he says, if you think sourcing retro is hard in Perth, try the South Island of New Zealand. <laughs> but part of my passion for the hobby is that I was playing Lords of Midnight on the Spectrum, or Eye of the Beholder on the Amiga reminds me of the UK and is probably the main reason I do this. So, Chris, thanks for all your contributions over the last two years. They are the reason the show has become part of my Sunday morning ritual here. I've subscribed to 005 Agima, and please keep playing the games you want to play and enjoy doing it. Um, nice comments there, but Chris has already explained his reasons. I don't want to repeat all that, but I actually felt the message was a good starting point for discussion, and it follows on from what Chris said about Play More in 24, and even from my own RPG rediscovery. Um, Neil? Yeah, it was a lovely comment, and there were lots of nice replies to that comment uh, there. And in YouTube, when we put the last week's show out, there's some lovely comments there, Chris, which uh, I, I know you've told us you're, you're humbled about, and... Um, you know, all, all lovely, lovely comments. Um, there's one uh, viewer in particular who wanted to pass on um, a little video message. So um, I'm going to put a link in the chat here for you because you haven't seen this yet. Um, and I think if we all click it together, we can all watch it together We're and about uh, to see what it. Chris makes of this. Where you put it? There you go. We've put it in the, uh, in the chat there. Hi, Chris. This is Wolf here. I understand you're a big fan. Now, your friends... Neil, Dave, and Duncan tell me that you had the ZX Spectrum computer game and you know me from that as the Barbarian. And later on, I became Wolf, so you know me as both characters. Now, they also tell me that you were really distracted from Maria Whitaker on the poster, which I can understand because she's a beautiful lady. They also tell me you look at my <laughs> post a lot and you totally understand that I'm always watching over you and I always will do. Even though I'm Wolf and the Barbarian, I'm mostly your guardian angel. Everyone is sorry to see you leave this week in Retro Podcast. Especially me. I know all about it because I watch over you. But know that you're always welcome back with open arms from all the guys there. And if Neil or Dave say otherwise, <laughs> they'd be foolish because they have to answer to me. Anyway, Chris, remember, I'm always watching over you. You take care. The guys are always welcome you back to the podcast. And be strong. Lots of love. Wolf. <laughs> what a legend. Oh, and whoever set that up, what a legend. Oh, far wow. out. Uh, That's freaking awesome. Really, it was wonderful when that came through. I was so happy. <laughs> and uh, I, I was happy because uh, on one level, Chris... Have I have I ruined the poster for you? Knowing now that whenever you look at it, the barbarian is watching over you at all times. <laughs> oh dear, that is a bit scary. That is a for bit listeners, scary. for listeners, Chris has the poster in the background, and he's got it zoomed in, so all you can see is Wolf's legs. <laughs> and this was this was not <laughs> set up. This is no, not set up. No idea <laughs> because. Oh, <laughs> I can't think why. I can't think why it's shifted down like that on my screen. Oh, that must be an like, so accident. crotch. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, no. Uh, I have wondered why Nikki hasn't complained about me having those posters up, right? But now, you know, you've pointed out that obviously there is another character on there, not just Maria Whittaker. That is fantastic. <laughs> and you know what? That is that is really cool because I know, I know it's the same in the UK. They've just relaunched Gladiators, and that's our family they viewing have. at the moment is – watching that nightly still love it absolutely so much fun and to have freaking a message from wolf wolf thank you so much that is awesome <laughs> have you got maria's number um <laughs> yeah that is that is amazing seriously i can't i don't know what to say i'm i'm speechless good so I'm well that's that's mumbling now enjoy whenever you like <laughs> um, yeah and it has been wonderful having you on the show uh, just as soon as i i managed to accidentally stop calling you john that happened for a while <laughs> especially when it was just you and you and me chris in those early days um accidentally kept calling you john um I just and, had a message um, from wolf 
in a mini app. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and, uh, and, and learning that uh, in time, I learned that to Australians, Chris is actually the least Australian man in the world. Whereas to me, it's like, oh, he sounds a bit Australian. It's true. Yeah. But no, other Australians have told us. <laughs> <laughs> don't sound Australian at all. <laughs> the fake Australian. Yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Springy talks about being time poor and I know how he feels I know Neil that's a concern for you and of course for Chris as well and this year I'm going to turn it around and get back into things I'm going to finish off my projects I'm going to do stuff I am making progress I've sorted out a few things here I'm making progress I miss the times when I was younger and I could sink into a game for days and be in that world and nowhere else travel to a, 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 travel to Britannia or or into space, into frontier, and just be somewhere else and not think about other things. I want to get back to that. And these days I have so much that I want to do and I don't get it all done. But how do you guys make sure that you make time for games? How do you do it, Chris? I ignore the chores, <laughs> first and foremost. And that, that's, that sounds like a silly thing to say, and that's probably very frustrating for Nikki. Um, but, but to a point, you can do all the chores and there will always be more. So you have to choose to just go, no, I'm going to have some me time. I'm just going to – I probably do that too much. That's my problem. Um, but I will happily let leaves lie in the garden as long as they're not a fire hazard or stuff like that. I, I can clear them up in a week's time, whatever. It doesn't matter. I've got more important things to do with my time than just constantly churning over the chores. I've never thought – that you could live in a country where leaving leaves in the garden is a fire hazard. That's that's, that's where we are. An Australian thing. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and um, watch. You're not going to like this one. Watch less YouTube and, and <laughs> or, or television. <laughs> but do, out, but do you know what I mean? Uh, well, I have to quantify that, and it is something I'm conscious of. I can sit on the couch because there's so much good content, and even just within this niche, right? There is so much content out there, and you literally can't watch it all. I can sit on a couch on a Saturday morning and then suddenly realize it's halfway through the afternoon and I've just gone video to video mm. to video, just yeah. just soaking yeah. it up. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and that's fine if that's what makes you happy and that's what relaxes you. But if you want to get play games, well, and especially in-depth games, well, guess what? At some point, you've got to stop watching other people play the games and get up off your backside, turn your computer on, and do it yourself. So, Yeah. Yeah. Those, those are my two tips. Watch less and, YouTube. <laughs> and the key to getting off your backside it. is is making sure that when you get the urge to play a game, it's easy, it's accessible, you can just yes. do it. Whether that's mm. using something like uh, the, a, the, you know, the A500 Mini or the Atari devices you've got recently, a Pi, mm. or um, in my case, something I always try to do every week when we have an open day on a Saturday is even though the, the cave is full of um, the public enjoying games, during a session, I always try and make at least 15 minutes to sit down and play a game myself on one of the machines, um, which is quite a nice way to do it because I'm surrounded by other people having fun and playing games and the noises of all the other machines. Um, I can't be on my phone. I can't be on my laptop because that, that would just be rude to be doing that in front of visitors <laughs> as if as if ignoring everyone and sitting on a computer for 15 minutes isn't rude. But it's a retro machine and it's just me and the machine for a bit of time. And, and that actually, I mentioned Shadow of the Beast on the FM Towns earlier. That's what I was doing on Saturday. I was playing mm. that. And then some people did come up to me and chatted to me about the game I was playing. Um, so I try and do that. Um but yeah, at home, it's so easy to get distracted by other things, whether it's YouTube um, or whatever else is pinging up on my computer. So I, I don't have the answer for you, Dave. I, I, I don't know. Uh, I, like you, would also like to make more time for games. Um, maybe I should review games. I don't know. But I do enjoy watching Chris on his YouTube channel. That I was talking last week about his Outrun video um, uh, a long time ago. He did a great F-18 video where he was racing a real F-18 and his Lotus video, all sorts of things on there. Um, so uh, I would encourage everyone to um, maybe as a, as a leaving gift from us all, go to YouTube, look up Aww. 005 Agima. That's Amiga backwards, of course, A-G-I-M-A. W5 Agima, hit subscribe and uh, carry on following uh, Chris because your videos are quite laid back, Chris. And actually, that's probably quite a nice way for you to make time to play games in the, in the yeah. style of the videos mm. that you make. Yeah, and that's why I'll keep doing that because I, the way I do it, it's um, I want to play this game right now anyway. I might as well record it, have a chat about my nostalgia attached to it, and that's it. There's no bells or whistles. Yeah, It's just just that. 
Yeah. Well, there Thanks, there are God. bells, but only if you've got the right RAM expansion on F eighteen. Then you get the bell. Then you get the bell in the intro. Very good. (laughs) Nice. So, again, play more in 24, and thanks for all the fish, Chris. Yeah, thank you, Chris. And as we've said, you're always welcome back. Um, Wolf is always watching over you, and he is the saddest of all to see you go. But we'll see you again, I'm sure. At least his legs are. Thanks, everyone. That's awesome. That's so awesome. It's your favourite part of the show. Is there any housekeeping to be had? I'd like to welcome two new patrons, Timothy and PS Labs. Thank you very much for signing up to us at www.com. I don't need the www. I keep doing it at patreon.com slash Patreon. this week in retro. Patreon. Patreon.com slash this week. It'd work with the W's. HTTPS. Whoa, 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 whoa. HTTPS. Yeah. yeah. Whack, you, need whack. It all. you need to type it all. Yeah. Yeah. That always Thank you for signing up. Whenever I used to call Microsoft support for some help on something and they'd give me a web address, um, invariably it'd be an Indian call center and they would use the word whack instead of slash. So they'd go HTTP oh. colon whack whack, and I'm like, first few times, what? Like, what 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 do you mean? <laughs> they're like, what do you mean you don't know what that is? You work in IT? Well, I've never heard it called that. Whack. <laughs> whack. Anyone <Slash>. else? Whack. <laughs> anyway, thank you for uh, signing up, thank uh, you Timothy signing up. and PS yeah. Labs. <laughs> so um, um, please go and join get- we get a huge number of stories submitted to our subreddit, reddit.com forward slash r forward slash this week in retro. Use the W's if you want to at the start of that address, uh, where you can submit your stories for us to talk about. You can comment on other people's stories and you can participate in our question of the week. Not all of the stories get uh, their own um, feature in the show, but here are some of the ones in brief that popped out for us. From Indigo, from Indigo Prime, they submitted the story that it's 40 years since Elite. Big birthday for Elite, a game that all three of us love. Absolutely groundbreaking game. We've talked about it a few times. It even got a mention earlier, or it sequel did uh, in the form of Frontier earlier. 40 years of Elite. What a game. Mm. Mm. From a brilliant username, Harmar Wonderbra. Um, <laughs> will Neil ever make more episodes of Finger Bobs? And for people <laughs> too young to know, or not from the UK, it was a wonderful kids' TV programme with little paper mice that were finger puppets and a guy that looked exactly like Neil, as oh, viewers yeah. will see, because Duncan will put it up. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the first time that comparison has been made. Um, I have been catching mice with traps in my garage lately, so I'm uh, whatever the opposite of Finger Bobs is. <laughs> I'm like the anti-Finger Bobs. Just shove your... Fi- no. Yeah, I was about to say, where well, you putting your fingers? Got to watch out for that. Um, <laughs> we on to the next one? Yes, we are. Um, a question from Sam Koinick. Uh, what terms do you use that are still retro? So it's not our question of the week, but one that's in the discussion. Um, and there's a discussion going on underneath it and people chiming in saying things like dialing into work or I'll tape it or computer bug or hang up a call and stuff like that. So, yeah. yeah. In- interesting What's one on the box? In. When our yeah. TVs haven't been shaped like a box for a very long time. That's true. <laughs> uh, a story from Star K 2084, the Pico ZX, which is a handheld, tiny, fully functional ZX Spectrum, uh, based, of course, on the Pico. This is a build video that's in the subreddit, so go and watch that if that interests you. Trevor Keverson has a link to a story from The Register, from a guy telling the story of him building the Spectrum 128K ROMs. I think the link he's got is to part one of that, and there'll be more. Quite interesting. I had a um, donation sometime back of ZX Spectrums from uh, Dr. Ian Logan, who authored a lot of books, uh, particularly about the ZX81 and onto the Spectrum. Um, And in that donation included a great big tractor feed print, huge wad of paper of the original ZX Spectrum ROM code, just printed out in a massive stack. So uh, we've carefully filed that in the inventory because that's a fun thing to have. 
Nice. Yeah. Very nice. Um, Stockade 2084 gave us another good story. Uh, let us know that Billy Mitchell and Twin Galaxies have settled out of court. Um, uh, doesn't look to have gone Billy Mitchell's way. I have actually been following this. So as I understand it, his scores are being reinstated, but in a historical archive version of the Twin Galaxies leaderboard only, not as recognised achievements or or as a current leaderboard standing. Um, so it's definitely worth having a look in the subreddit to um, read up on it. And also uh, there's a guy in Australia called, um, I think he's Australian, might be New Zealand. I, I do sometimes get those wrong still to this day. Pretty sure he's Australian. Um, Carl Jobs. Worst Australian um, in the world. Worst, worst <laughs> fake Australian. Carl Jobs, uh, or Carl Job ST, however you want to pronounce it. Um, but he's been covering this for a long time. He's actually quite hilarious, and I believe he's been involved in some legal action as well regarding the whole thing. So definitely have a look at his channel because, yeah, he, he has a very interesting slot on that whole saga. Sounds um, very odd, doesn't it? Like Billy Mitch was sort of been relegated to this um, – archived scoreboard and it's where and all the new... cheap scores go where, where <laughs> someone gets found to be cheating they end up going on that and that's oh, why you've got to be careful Dave allegedly but, allegedly allegedly, allegedly. But, but I, I, I'm not I'm an expert I'm no longer part of this podcast by the way you can't take me to court I, I'm not <laughs> going to judge I cannot judge whether he has or hasn't been but yes. that's the people who are also on that that list well, there you go Lord Borak let us know the release date of Star Wars Dark Forces, The Thinking Man's Doom. It's February the 28th. Dave. Your story earlier on was submitted by Lord Borak and you missed something. <gasps> on the submission, he added a comment to the submission and he says, Amiga never dies, Dave. <laughs> 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 it never dies. He's right. There, there are loads more on the subreddit. Um, about twice as much things I wanted to talk about this week. There's so much to talk about. Have a look there if you want to. It's a nice way to browse what's going on, submit stuff, let us know about it. Uh, enjoy yourself. Most of us recall with uh, fond nostalgia our local independent computer shops um, where we go in wide-eyed, either with empty pockets or, if we were lucky, with just enough pocket money to buy something. Uh, my favourite among the many that were in Tunbridge Wells was Megabytes. Um, it was owned by, I'm pretty sure his name was John, but it might be a mismemory, but I think his name was John, um, and his wife. Um, so they ran it together. It was their business. It was their livelihood. It was their life. Um, time marches on. And these amazing family-owned businesses were allegedly, using that word carefully again, allegedly aggressively smashed into submission and closed down by the big high street franchise giants. Every time I hear the store name Game, my ears prick up for two reasons. Megabytes closed its doors very sadly because the owners saw the writing on the wall and fell on their sword. There's no official link be between these two events, but I'll, I'll tell it as, as it happened or as I remember it. Um, but I'm going to tread carefully and say things like allegedly over and over again. Um, but, you know, because games still exist. But according to the owner of Megabytes, I remember him telling us when we went into the shop, on the run-up to game opening, because the town was getting a nice brand new shiny shopping mall around 1992 called the Royal Victoria Place, on the run-up to all this happening and, and knowing that game was going to open in that store, men in suits would allegedly visit med Megabytes and the owner observed them just looking over the stock with a notepad and pen, taking notes on what he believes were his, his stock and specifically probably the prices. And sure enough, game opened and all the other independent shops in town died a slow and painful death, including including Wizbit Games. Um, ha, ha, this and, away. Ha, ha, that away. Ha, ha, of course, this away. not the same one. <laughs> that is Wizbit. Paul Daniels um, was in there. Yeah, selling you right. hooky, hooky pirated discs under the counter. You'll like it. Not that's a lot. My zipstick, <laughs> my zipstick from Wizbit. Anyway, um, and Volunteers was another one, a couple of others. There were, there were quite a few shops in town, and they all died this slow, painful death after game opened. <laughs> Sorry, we have an international audience. I should probably explain. There was a TV show called Wizbit hosted by magician Paul Daniels. Um, that, that's what I was talking about there. I haven't gone completely insane. Carry on, Chris. He's gone completely insane. Um, uh, the other reason why my ears prick up when the name Game is mentioned is because, well, Game ended up giving me a job in, in that same store that had closed my favourite 
independent shop. Traitor. In 1994. Well, do you know what? I'd ask Megabytes over and over again, do you have any work? Do you have any work? Do you have any work? And it was always no. Polite no. Um, And so, yeah, game opened up. They were gone and uh, eventually got a job on the run-up to one of the Christmas uh, periods. You you became Debbie McGee. And it was... I did. (laughs) It was... Anyway. uh, But basically, I mean... Seriously, this was fulfilling my dream to work in a computer game shop. And it lasted a few short weeks before they sacked me. Why did they sack me? Because I didn't know the release date for Mrs. Doubtfire on (laughs) VHS. I'm I'm not even joking, right? And I was accused of being rude and abrupt uh, uh, by the... Because basically they got... You know, you get those mystery shoppers... Yeah. Um, to test your staff. Give me my. I'd literally been there for about. I think it was about three weeks. I've been there, um, and they had one on the phone. Funnily enough, everybody else in the store went out the back, so they knew, somebody knew what was going on. Right. This is so it was like, oh, will it? Will it? Will it? Chris handle that? Whatever. Anyway, phone rings. I take this call. They ask release date for Mrs. Doubtfire. I didn't even know. We'd only just started doing videos because it's a game shop, right? And um, I hadn't even been shown that we had a folder with release dates for movies. I knew there was one for games, not for movies. So that's how this all eventuated. Can you can can you remember how the conversation went? Can you remember any details of it? Yeah, no, I can more or less because thinking on my feet, I couldn't leave the counter, so I couldn't go and ask for help. I couldn't transfer the call because I haven't been shown how to do that either. Um, and so I knew we had a release date folder for games, like I just said. Yeah. Didn't know where I'd find a release date for Mrs. Doubtfire. I hadn't seen any promotional material for Mrs. Doubtfire. Um, and what I did know was that it had been fairly recent in the cinema, and usually stuff goes from cinema to rental, as it did back then, before you can buy it in the shop. So that was my yeah. response. I said, oh, I know it's, been, it's only recently been in the cinema. Usually they go um, to um, out for rental before you can – buy them so it might be quite a while to wait yet and i did say and i said you know enough we we don't we don't rent videos out what i was quoted as saying i was quoted as saying we're not a video hire shop like (laughs) just one short shot yeah yeah so yeah not not the full conversation there's uh, you know the reason why this stuck with me and uh, i can remember it in such clear detail is because well clearly it made an impact on me hey you know because uh i wanted to work in game and this was the end of it go on sorry I can't say I ever remember my game or any of the games I went to renting videos out. Was that? No, that's what that I think. Well, no, that's what I, 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 My, no, that's my local I, one, I phoned them up once to find out if they had a video. The guy was really rude and I never went back since. And that was in Tunbridge yeah. Wells. So that's what I'm saying. They don't. They didn't rent them out. So we didn't rent them out. Um, we we would only sell videos. So I, my response was, you know, it's only just been in the cinema. Usually films go for rental, not in game, but saying, you know, for rental at places like Blockbuster or whatever. Um, we don't rent videos out. We only sell them. And um, so it will be a while. I think it was actually out that week. <laughs> but anyway, okay. I didn't. I didn't. Or the week after, something like that. But anyway. The, the end result bet, is, you know, I lo- go on. I bet Dave can do a good Mrs. Doubtfire. Go I can't on, even Dave. remember the Ooh, accent yeah. from it. I can't. I, I don't, <laughs> was that a Scottish <laughs> accent? Scottish, yeah, Scottish. Yeah, it was Scottish. Was it? Yeah. Well, there you go. I'm Mrs. Doubtfire. There you go. There's a, there's a Mrs. Doubtfire. <laughs> that Doubtfire was amazing. It'll, incredible. Were you in the movie? Anyway. Um, what happened next, Chris? Well, it was just it, it was just an interesting experience for me. You know, first nice job in retail that I you know wanted to do for ages, and there were no second chances. It was just that one call, no second chances, no. Let's use this as a training opportunity to upskill you. It was just see you later. Actually, no, I lie. Mm-hmm. They did use it as a training opportunity, not for me, but for a potential future manager in training who I'd already befriended in the store. So he was sort of the best mate I had already at work. And he was sat in on the meeting so that he could see how to fire someone. Oh, brilliant. That was brilliant. nice. That was nice. I always think back to how we were when we were in our teens and early 20s compared to how we are now in our 40s. Can you imagine your work trying something like that with you now? No you way. just laugh at them. You no would just way. laugh at them. Sit yes. down. We'll talk about this. Yeah. That's not, absolutely not happening. Yeah, 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 ridiculous stuff they do to teenagers. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, I had to include the above. And, and look, that ended well because I ended up working in Woolworths, which paid more anyway, and they put me on the entertainment mm-hmm. counter. So I was still I'm selling computer games. So that's <laughs> fine. Um, but anyway, 
Um, but I had to include that in the above because because it, it explains and it gives context as to why I have very little love for game, even though I'll happily shop at EB Games, which is really the same thing. Um, but yeah, just wanted to give you a bit of context onto my mood. Um, and yeah, when I when I visit my hometown now, when I do, I actually feel quite sad when I go to that same shopping centre and game isn't there. It's closed down. It's it's gone. It's dead. Like the family yeah. owned businesses. Because you, you burnt it. Went laugh. before it. Yeah, because I burned it. No, I didn't. <laughs> I did not burn it. I did. You can't prove anything. No. Um, <laughs> um, it just closed, all right? Uh, but anyway, my ears were pricked up again this week because game are back in the news. According to several sources, including one shared by Dr. Local in the subreddit, which is a, it's a piece on metro.co.uk by Adam Starkey. Uh, game are going to stop trading trade-ins. They're going to stop doing trading games. So in case you're not aware, game like EB Games, JB Hi-Fi here in Australia, and CEX have happily uh, offered store credit in exchange for some of your old games and systems. But with the march of online stores, uh, digital-only content, and also um, the shrinkage of game itself, you know, now closing stores and hiding the remnants in the back of sports clothing shops, instead, game are going to stop trading in old games. Uh, now, EB Games, and I think JB Hi-Fi here in Australia as well, they kind of reined it in a while ago. So what they've done is that they'll still do trading games, but they've stopped doing several generations. They don't go as far back as like the PS1, PS2 and all that. They just do current gen and then the previous gen, and, and that's your lot. So you can happily, which helps people sort of move from one system to another, I guess, so there's sense in that. Uh, but game, we're taking things like you know PS2 games, for example, and you know, now they're just going to stop all game trading according to what we're reading online. Game are also doing some other things to try and survive, um, like selling toys and pop culture items rather than just games. And again, that's actually been successful uh, for places like those that I mentioned, you know, EB Games and, and JB Hi-Fi, especially things like retro-related items like Star Wars vintage figure collections uh, or Transformer reissues and stuff like that. Essentially, what they're recognizing and catering towards is the midlife collectors with actual cash in their pockets, while still also trying to remain relevant to the new generations. But this, of course, leaves, in the UK anyway, just CEX having almost a monopoly on big franchise game trading shops. So I think this is a huge topic. Uh, what are your thoughts on game's approach in stopping trading? And also, do you guys have any memories of game? And also, is this fulfilling the prophecy that we've talked about before, that downloading uh, you know, or download-only games will kill the on-selling and the future of games collections going forward? What do you think, Neil? Well, um, I have a confession. I've never traded in a game at game. Um Never, never crossed my mind. I mean, there was a period where there was a market trader uh, in in Pool who I would go to, um, town called Pool, and um, I would trade my games in, and that's where I, I, I <laughs> before he closed down, he just seemed to get bigger and bigger. I don't know how his business worked because he was obviously taking in more games than he was ever selling, and then he was having to rent more and more space. So, hang on, that's that sounds like a familiar story. <laughs> sounds like what's happening to the cave. <laughs> uh -oh. And then ultimately it all collapsed. But um, yeah, I don't know how his business worked, but I would trade in particularly old games for not very much money. But he would still do a good deal because you were also you were also buying used games from him. I don't know if that is that how it worked in game. Could you trade in a used game and buy a used game? Or were they all, you had to buy I new games? I assume so, because what are they going to do? Just put the them in their own personal collection? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe they sold them online or something. No, I you don't can know. buy them. You can buy them. <laughs> okay. Um, and it's that place where I got ridiculously cheap copies of Ultima and things like that just as he was closing down. I wish I'd still kept hold of them because I didn't. Anyway, never traded in a game at game. Um, I like that you mentioned the back of a sports shop because it's, it was only a few months ago that I went to a retail park. I saw an A board in the car park, the big game logo. Cool. I thought I've not been to a game store for years. I'll check it out. Followed it into a sports direct, which then directed me to the very far corner of the second floor. I had to go up the stairs into the corner. When I got there, game was in fact a sports direct checkout with a game logo on the wall behind it and a single row of hooks with gift vouchers for the Xbox and the PlayStation online store. And that 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 was game. That was it. There wasn't even a tub's duck to look at. It was just it was just that. Or a well Funko Pops, that's the other thing, isn't it? There wasn't yeah. even a Funko Pop to be had. That's um, 
So I don't know what I expected. You know, it's not like there were many boxed games released these days to look at. I, I just sort of fell into this suspended belief for a moment that there might be something more there. But I do have fond memories of game because it was just a train ride away for me when it when the nearest one first opened as a teenager. Um, I'd take a train to to the bigger town, spending an age deciding on what to spend my budget on, reading the manual on the train on the way home, trying not to, you know, get attacked by the tramp on the train or whatever else, you know, uh, making my way through the big bad world of Dorset um, <laughs> and home with my game to play it. Um, but it's been at least 15 years since that started declining at least if not longer since these shops started declining in what they could offer and the whole experience and just filling it with junk. I have to say it, not video games, but just, I know people like to collect certain things, but I didn't want it in game. And it just felt like game was turning into a bit of a tat store for me. I really didn't, didn't like that experience. So, you know, there's a reason why I recreated my own W8 Smith to go and wallow in my own memories in <laughs> the uh try and suspend the heyday of video game stores but fundamentally there's an underlying problem here which is there are simply no games to trade in we are we're not at that point but you know we're getting to that point it must be a very complex system now for them where if you try and trade a game in well has it been activated can it be activated again can this game actually be played by anyone else or is it just a you know land piece of landfill um and that's been happening for a long time. And and it's just going to be online games soon or very limited special editions. So the time had to come, and I think they're being sensible by planning ahead, to be honest. So uh, for me, this is all about the end of physical games. Uh, that, that's what this means to me. I, I don't... I, I can't even remember if I've been into a game or not because all those game shops back in the day... I couldn't even tell you what the name was in the front of the store. I just knew where they were. Um, so I, I, I kind of feel as if I should be angry or annoyed about the end of physical games, but I'm just a bit sad and I understand why. Ever since I got Steam, I realised that for modern games, it's the only way to do it. Patches, download management, file integrity. The idea that on, on Steam you can you can click and you can check the file integrity and it'll sometimes find problems. Um, it's the way to go. It sorts all sorts of problems that we've got with physical releases. Physical releases now for a long time have just been a way of avoiding the big initial download and usually you've got to link them to Steam or to something else to do it. There is um there is a line to be drawn there though. I think too many games are released under early access without really being upfront about the fact that it's early access. And yes. I think Steam should have a a thing or any online store should have a thing with a great big banner that says still under early access. Um because I don't particularly want to buy a game until it's at version 1 and those bugs have been yeah, you know, I don't want to play 30 hours of the same game to see what they've changed about it to get a better experience because they've tweaked a few things. I want I want all of that up front. Um and I know that's the way it is, but the most recent example of this is the B17 game that I mentioned last week is is coming out very soon. Um as I read more into the press pack, they started using the word early access. I was like, I don't I don't want an early access game. I want to play a finished game and enjoy it in all its glory. Um is that selfish? Because no. I want to enjoy the efforts of other people who do do that. I don't know. Early access to me, it's, it's a good way of ruining a game. You, you see, yeah. you see a an incomplete, an un unfinished game, and then when you, when it is finished, you can't go and play it for the first time. But that's how things are now. That that's how things are. Even physical releases. I mean, I bought the physical release of. Um, Oh, I forgot a Thimbleweed Park, and it's sitting up there on my shelf. And on the outside of the package is the game code. So it comes with a game code, which I need to use to play the game. It's on the outside of the package because the package is designed to be sealed forever by lots of people and never opened. Um, oh, it's, a, it, it's, it's a tomb for the content inside. Yeah. And I don't believe you can play the game without that code. So... It's just a carrier for a game code now. Yeah. Um, so those physical releases, in most cases, I wouldn't expect to put them in and be able to play the game without having to to, to pair it to an online an online platform. So for that reason, physical games aren't aren't really that 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 big of a deal for me now. 
Has anyone come up with a front end for Steam in VR where you can kind of browse your shelves as if you've got all the big boxed copies of the games in your Ooh. Steam library and be cool. pull them out? Well, that'd look be at nice. Them. Yeah. Mm. That would <laughs> Surely be nice. somebody's done that. Surely. Yeah. Well, how do you do so, Because Steam supports VR, so is there already a thing? I don't know. Okay. Maybe. Must, surely it must be. But um, the, the days of a complete game on a disc or a, or a, disc, um, or a cartridge are out the window and that probably explains a lot of the appeal in the 2600 plus and in some ways maybe the switch as well and in retro gaming in general hold it and touch it pick it up and know that what you've got in your hand is the complete game you're not going to put it in it's not going to say here's a, a 40 gigabyte day one patch and um buy this and you're missing out on this and dlc and link your account here and buy some game coins so i did uh, I, I did come across um, something else. In fact, before I move on to that, Neil, you mentioned CEX struggling to handle games. I don't know how they do it. I didn't even think most modern games could be traded because once you use the code, that's it. But anyway, um, I came across a story this week that I thought would link into this because I'm sure to, one of us would pick it. Do you want me to tell you the last game I bought from CEX? Yeah. Airport Firefighter Simulator. <laughs> <laughs> That sounds awesome. I had an idea oh. once when I was in CX. I thought I could make a video about all of those weird, bizarre, and awful simulators. So I started buying them, and that was one of them in there. And it's you, you know you're in a fire truck on an airport, and you've got to zoom out when a plane catches fire, fire and hmm. fire out. Um, and I think there was forklift truck simulator as well, or something like that. I got at the same time. So yeah. that's genuinely the light. And I think it was one pound. So there are there are games out there, but even that I think was a fifteen year old or so game when I bought it. So mm. CX does have some you know retro stuff. It's got certainly got PlayStation Two and Wii stuff in CX, doesn't it? Um, I, I, mean, I I did buy some games. I bought um, the Fallout games and Mass Effect and so on, just in these keep cases, just mm. really for my shelf. These are games I own digitally already, but I wanted to have them on my shelf. I wanted to have something physical on my shelf. But I noticed something that really kind of—I knew we were going to cover this, so I—I—I I, I read into this. It's from uh, Larian. So Larian made last year's staggering successful game, Baldur's Gate Three. It's a top game in Steam. Apparently, took six hundred and fifty million dollars in Steam, miles ahead, more than oh, I think twice ahead of anything else. And the thing about Larian was in response to Ubisoft subscription director Philip. Uh, Trombley saying that gamers should be comfortable not owning games uh, when he was talking about consumer mm, behavior. So not just not buying a game and having a code, but not owning games at all. And a lot of backlash that people don't like it. And Larian Studios CEO Sven Vink said in response to that, he said that the games from his studio including Baldur's Gate 3 will never appear on the subscription service. And that's them holding out and saying, no, if you want our games, you'll buy the game rather than having it on the subscription service. And he talked in, in in a lot of sense about how it changes games if they have to compete on a subscription service. I just wanted to correct myself from what I said earlier. Um, game, sorry, CEX, sell uh, PS2 and Wii. Well, actually, I'm on their website having a browse of what they what they do sell retro-wise. They sell NES consoles and cartridges, mm -hmm. Mega Drive, um, Master. They, they don't seem to do any tapes or micros it's all cartridges for obvious reasons reliability reasons yeah. and it's easy for them to test so um you know cx is to be considered uh, a retro outlet mm, um yeah. so mm. there's they've, they've got plenty to offer beyond just the online activated game <laughs> sorry just as i'm browsing dave a copy of series one of rapsy nesbit on dvd has just appeared <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Uh, you need to get your. I'll back. tell you this, boy. <laughs> <laughs> Beat it. Um, so uh, yeah, it, it, they've got plenty to offer, but they are going to face exactly the same challenges that I think gamer for seeing, which is what what, what exactly they, they, to trade him. They, they they might they might do better because if game aren't doing it, it leaves more room for CX to do it, mm -hmm. and I think we're at a point where those. Mega Drive and SNES games, they're not going to get less popular, are they? They're, they're still going to be there. So maybe maybe there is a market forever for CX or for at least 15, 20 years for them. Maybe. What um, do you think they'll give me for the cave? 
Um, <laughs> a lot. The K must. The K must be worth a fortune, Neil. Have you worked well, out? trading it at CEX. It won't be. The, yeah, <laughs> the inventory. The inventory will figure that out. It's it's a long process, <laughs> but we're going through it. Yeah, like you say, Dave, to make so, sure it's properly insured. The appeal of Baldur's Gate Three was that it was cut off from modern trends in digital-only games. Baldur's Gate 3 is a complete game. You install it. In fact, there's a version on GOG that you can download without DRM. You can install it and play it as far as I know. Um, you can sign into your, your Larian account or not. You don't need to. And you can play that on your own, completely single player, isolated for things. And obviously it's resonated with people because of the amount of money it took last year. It's the biggest game of 2023. It's going to start all sorts of things going. And while it is, yeah, it's a digital only game. They are coming out with physical copies finally, but it is, it's really a digital only game in that you wouldn't trade it the same way you would other things. But at least it's not going the whole online subscription way. And for me, there's, there's there's a Dylan Thomas poem that, that I, I often think of, and it's, do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should burn and rave at the close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. And it's it's appropriate here because these are, this is what we love, and it's turning into this, this, this cheap online subscription, millions of games, all the same rubbish. So, yeah, there you go. That's my rant for today. Chris, will you be leaving in a rage into the dying of the light? I try and stay. I think I'm too I'm too happy a person, a positive person to be angry. I just hold well, these game, I do hold these grudges for many, the many years. <laughs> yeah, I do hold the grudges, but to actually be actively angry, it's it's too hard. It takes too much effort. Imagine um, imagine imagine knowing that Mrs. Doubtfire was your downfall. I know, and I hate that movie anyway. Uh, and I like Robin Williams movies uh, apart from that one. What I don't understand is you're talking about her release. I didn't even know she was in prison. Yeah, it's true. No wonder I didn't know the answer. But anyway, as I opened with, I have no love for game, and yet I'm actually sad to see where they've ended up, even though they tried to charge me for the uniform after they sacked me. Um, oh, I'd be down there. I'd be fighting them. Anyway. I'd be furious. Um, oh, I did. They did they, they actually took it out of my last pay and I got them to pay it back. The reason I'm sad, though, and I am sad, is because, like many of us, despite the allegedly aggressive business practices which may or may not have taken place and closed the stores we loved, um, and then, you know, Game then took over that role. They became the new meeting place. Um, and they had massive collections. They were fantastic shops. And they had the latest and greatest, and they had plenty of copies of it, not just one or two, which some of the older, smaller stalls might have done. Well, and they had machines set up for you to try before you buy, which was, you know, great. They'd learned from the indies in doing that. So I kind of hated them because I loved them. You know, I'm still loyal towards megabytes, but the game were fantastic. I hate to say it, but, you know, their stores in the 90s were amazing and they were actually quite magical. And I loved, I seriously loved landing a job there. It, it really was a dream come true, briefly. Now, they're part of the nostalgia. They're part of the history and they're part of my history. However, I now have to possibly also watch Game endure a slow, painful demise. As we've touched on before... Vintage gaming is rife, and the success uh, with the you know really collectible stuff is not in trading cheap PS2 discs in scuffed up sleeves with missing manuals. It's in big box collecting. It's in small C64 Amstrad and Spectrum cassette collecting. They might not even work, but we actually don't care. We just want it for the shelf. You know, it's in you know for reasons I can't fathom. Boxed, complete, but rubbish, overpriced Atari Jaguar games. That's where the collecting is at, um, and it's. You know, uh, it's even in anything that came on double density disc. And they definitely won't work. Uh, accompanied by <laughs> amazing box art, free posters inside, printed manuals, actual real physical manuals. So, with game possibly being killed off by online stores and digital only gaming, where can you walk in and pick up retro games, usually complete and in good condition? Well, small, family owned, independent retro gaming shops. Retro gaming is a dish best served cold. Time now for our community question of the week. And last week it was all about Sega. We asked, 
What are your top three Sega games? Any platform, not just arcade games. Fail to match Dave's top three and be prepared for him to tell you why you are wrong. I think that applies every <laughs> week, doesn't it? Be prepared for Dave to tell you why you're wrong. No. Are you insinuating I've got opinions? <laughs> not at all. Okay, question of the week. Um, let's take it out of contest mode. See if we get any submissions while we've been live, like last week. That was so funny. Uh, yeah, let's refresh that. We did have a comment. Um, I can't remember the name of the person now. I do apologize. But the person who made a comment while we were trying to read these last week heard it and replied in the YouTube comment. So that's nice to see. Okay, X Battle Station is the top of our list. They say, pretty easy for me. Sonic 1 on the Mega Drive. Virtua Racing in the arcade. Sega Rally in the arcade. Pure 90s bliss. It's very much um, a 90s selection, but it is a solid selection. Who wants to read the next one? Dave can go next. Richard Shears. Hello, Rich. He says, the top three Sega games. Man, this is going to be hard. Top 20 might be needed. Right, let's see how I can squeeze in the top three. Number one, Choplifter. Why I hear nobody ask? Because it was the first arcade game I ever played and the first to consume one of my hard-earned 10 Ps. Great game. Uh, just to correct you, Dave, number three, that's his number three, so he's going three down to one. Right. Even though it's a one beside it? No, it's, no, it's a got three, a three beside, beside it. it. No, it's a three. one beside it. Three. three beside it. Dot. One. It's the three. One. What are you looking at? <laughs> Three dot chopper lifter. Three dot chop lifter. One dot chop lifter. Are you getting a migraine? Where are you reading no. this? On right. Reddit. What I put it in the. I put it in. The, I put it in the, the the chat. Have a look at the chat. Hang on. I don't see what anything in the chat. In the, in the Discord, he means. Yeah. Oh, in the, okay. It says one dot. What? Has Rich okay. literally just edited it or something? Here's what this we're seeing. What edited one day ago, so it's not been edited now. So uh, is this a, because of the different Reddit views? Is there a, is there a different red? Am I an old Reddit view, which is different formatting? I don't, I don't know. know. Yeah, we both see well, three. But, but that's, yeah, because maybe on your screen, it's doing an automatic numbered list yeah. rather than what Rich has actually typed. That's the only Shall thing we repeat I repeat it again? This isn't of any interest to anyone. Nobody needs to hear this. <laughs> no, no, we'll take all this out. Yeah. Yeah. So, <clears throat> do you want to leave me back in again or do I just okay. go? Okay. Just go. Dave, do you want to read the next one? So top three Sega games. He says, man, this is going to be hard. It's Richard Shears, our friend Rich. Top 20 might be needed. So he says, right, let's see how I can squeeze in the top three. It says number three, Choplifter. Why I hear nobody ask? Because it was the first arcade game I ever played and the first to consume one of my hard-end 10 Ps. Okay. Number two is Afterburner. Yeah, it wasn't a great game, and I was a flight sim nut, but the pure adrenaline lush, rush when playing the game was simply mind-blowing, at least for a brief period. But the memories lasted when I last checked until 2024. I wonder if he means in the arcade afterburner because it's a bit underwhelming on a micro. Mm. Um, and he's cheated. He's cheated. Adren Adrenaline Lush, by the way, is one of the gladiators. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see the thing on Twitter with the fake I new did. gladiators? Yeah. Oh, the gladiators are called Spag Bow. <laughs> oh, no, I haven't seen that. Nice. Discharge. <laughs> We got different gladiators over here, but they're all called Shane. Shane, <laughs> Shane, Shane, Shane. <laughs> Sheila. <laughs> no, even the girls are called Shane. Anyway, <laughs> Richard, Richard, here. Sorry, uh, number one C, Super Hang On. This was in our arcade before the other title that might be mentioned and really felt wonderful at the time. Hang on, you can't split a top three into A, B, and C. It's Your, rich. Well, he's done it. It's he rich. has. <laughs> Clearly, you can. Things Rich could do, you know, they're amazing. <laughs> Number one B, Outrun. He said, well, it had to be a legend that stuck. I might have preferred the gameplay of Super Hang On, correct? But when looking through a cold light, 
but OutRun had more of the experience. The music was really magical and instantly recognisable. The graphics were also pleasing on the eye and the girlfriend, just like all mine back in those times. <laughs> um, and he says, number 1A. So this is his top game. And of course, he's being correct about it. He's saying, Golden Axe. My times in the arcade were drawing closer to the end. School years were nearly behind me, and I knew that I would lose my school friends to college, but this was a game of choice. We could play together. It was fun, not frustrating. It must have had a charm given that we both had our Amigas by this point and would typically go to one or the other's house to use those, yet it still drew us back to the smoke-reeking, dark, sticky carpet pit that the arcade was becoming. Uh, entropy, how light and promising of a dark future has faded. Uh, and now that I've bent the rules, broken is the word you meant to use there, Richard, and <laughs> given bad. three number ones, I'll shut up with just one final thing. Andrew Archer, wherever you are now, thank you for being that friend. I hope you are well and truly enjoying a good life, Rich. And Rich... As a surprise for you, we've managed to track down. No, we haven't. We haven't. <laughs> nice. Chris, do you want to read the next answer? Yeah, so this is Kess Monkey. His, his number one is Shinobi in the arcade. Kes, Kes, can I just say Kess Monkey's cheated even more than Rich here? Just point this out. Oh, the honourable mentions. Oh, wow, yes. <laughs> There's about yeah. 20 of them. But anyway, yeah. so Shinobi in the arcade, not my favourite Sega game, but also, uh, not sorry, not just my favourite Sega arcade game. <laughs> Far out. Uh, it's my last show, guys. Um, <laughs> but also my favourite arcade game and my favourite 16-bit game. Uh, mm. The number two, he's got Outrun in the arcade. And the number three, he's got Outrun 2006 Coast to Coast on the Xbox, which is also fantastic in the arcade. The only arcade game I've completed, because it's just like the home consoles, PS3. Is... Do you want to rattle off the honourable mentions? I will. Well? <laughs> the honourable mentions, Daytona, Sega Rally, Super Hang On, Power Drift, Turbo Outrun, Afterburner 2, Enduro Racer, Thunderblade, Galaxy Force 2, Outrunners, Space Harrier, and Choplifter, all arcade versions. Good picks. Go. Very good picks. Um, all good picks, but I, I would probably take Thunderblade off that list. I, I never thought that was a very good game. It was really it hard. Just, just didn't it's work. interesting, though. Yeah, it, it is it interesting. It was quite unique. And you had yeah. the controls, and you had to hold up the cyclic. And, yeah. 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 Um, so thank you to everyone who took part. Uh, Tech made easy. Um, Christ of what you, uh, Christoph, what you, why, why do you? That name always throws me. Um, Ralph wants it. Uh, Colony activist. Frosty cheesecake. Generation pixel. Uh, fsk it. Guy Rush loves Tesla. Rich Neptune. How uh, Rickalicious D. Johan Wending. Antiques for geeks. Happy coding. Jeff Mendoza. Uh, fourth directive and. Wood Ape 2000, a huge list of people who have all participated. Thank you so and much more. for sharing your thoughts. Mm. Oh, and mm. more. There's another page of them. So <clears throat> I'm just going to make another list if I carry on like this. But um, thank you, everyone, for top, for participating. You can take part at reddit.com, for, sorry, www.reddit.com forward slash this uh, R forward slash this week in retro. Um, or just search for us, as, as as people now say. Just search for This Week in Retro and you'll find us. Uh, and you can participate in this week's community question of the week. The question of the week this week is, do you remember Chris? <laughs> 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 do, you, do, you remember, do you remember how he still hates game for sacking him? Do you remember? Do you remember? Are you nostalgic for Chris? I, I hate game for sacking him. <laughs> do you remember Chris, Dave? Do you remember him? Um, Chris. Well, now it's your turn. Oh, yeah. Do you remember Chris? Yeah. I'm still in the yeah. room. Guy. I'm still in yeah. the room. Yeah. Um, well, we well, sacked him. Well, now it's your turn. Pretty. What in retro do you have an irrational hatred of? Not that I'm saying Chris's hatred of game was, uh, you know, irrational. He was sacked in an irrational manner. Um, <laughs> but let's just twist the question. What do you have an irrational hatred of in retro? What has bugged you for years or even just days? What do you know you're overreacting to? but you just can't get over it and it will forever bug you. That's the question. All that remains now is to say a huge thank you to Chris for everything that he's done for the show. Thank you, Chris. It's been a pleasure having you on here and I'm looking forward to the day you come back as a guest and uh, share your, your stories and your memories and your opinions with us again. It will happen more than once, I'm sure. So it doesn't really feel like a goodbye, but it is a goodbye. Thanks, um, guys. So... Thank you, Chris. I really Dave, anything you want to add? 
No, I, 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 I thank you, Chris. Uh, you'll so many wonderful comments by our listeners on on you. I couldn't put it any better. It's any better myself. Um, it's been great having you on here. Um, please do come back. We will hold you that. I will book you in soon. Uh, we have a guest next week to fill the the gaping chasm that you've left. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward to that particular guest. No spoilers. Um, but thank you for, for all the time being here. Two years and more to come. If you miss Chris, remember to go. He has got a YouTube channel. You can sit and hang out with him on there while he, he goes plays through his favourite games. But yeah, there we go. I just want to thank you once again for having me on, you know, for putting out the, you know, the offer for, to come on in the first place. I've said it before. I'll say it 101 times. So totally unexpected. And I have actually enjoyed every minute of of these catch ups. You know, it's only it's only the the work behind the scenes that I kind of grew tired of um, over time. And it was over time, but yeah, the catching up with you guys, I, I feel we've become mates. Um, it's fantastic. So, and to everybody that's listened and, and has enjoyed having me on, thank you to you as well. Because um, yeah, really, really do appreciate you spending you know an hour of your day to listen to me swear about somewhere that sacked me thirty odd years ago. <laughs> Thanks. An hour and a half this time. Yep. Big long episode. And on that note, we say thank you to everyone for taking the time to listen. And one last time, Chris, he's waving. Bye. Oh. <laughs> Bye. They had Wolf. There was a message from Wolf. <laughs> <laughs> he's watching you. <laughs> he's always watching you. <laughs> <laughs> This Week in Retro was presented by Neil from RMC The Cave, Chris from 005 Agima, and Dave. It was produced by me, Duncan Styles. The podcast version of the show is available through your favourite podcaster, including Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And the video version is available on the This Week in Retro YouTube channel. Join our community subreddit at r slash this week in retro to suggest and vote on the stories we cover on the show. If you watch this week in retro on YouTube, please give us a like and subscribe to help us reach new viewers. If you enjoy our show and would like to support it, then please check out the link to our Patreon page in the show notes or description. Thank you for listening and we'll see you next time for more up to date news for out of date tech. I've been Chris Winter for This Week in Retro. F*** you game and good night.